Welcome back, everyone. This is uh, the fourth panel, which, taking from uh, Jack's letter, encompasses broad areas of the earth sciences, including the environment. I'm Jay Banner. I'm on the faculty in the Department of Geological Sciences, and I direct UT's Environmental Science Institute. And let me introduce you to our panelists. And let me start out by saying, giving an overall uh, call out to all of them. They're all uh, leaders in their field of study. I'm really fortunate to have them here on the panel today. So I'll start with uh, Dan Breaker, and Dan is an associate professor in the Department of Geological Sciences. He teaches uh, intro geology and environmental isotope geochemistry. And Dan studies ancient climates and the ways in which soils and caves record them. Uh, next we have uh, Adam Bowerman. Adam is a uh, PhD student in climate dynamics with a background in geological sciences. And he studies the regional and global teleconnections that impact climate variability of the Intra-Americas region. All right. We also have uh, Jeannie Catania. She's an associate professor with joint appointments in the department as well as in the Institute for Geophysics. She works on understanding the physical processes that control glaciers, glaciers and ice sheets and really tries to get an understanding of how ice sheet changes arise from both natural and forced variability. Okay, and uh, we also have Michael Young, and Michael is Associate Director in the Bureau, and he's also a Senior Research Scientist. He directs a division of 25 environmental geoscientists, and his own research specializes on soil zones and how water and energy is transferred in soil zones. All right, well, given that introduction, of our panelists, I'd like to then turn to our keynote speaker, Mary Lou Hastings. Mary Lou is Vice President with the uh, Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation. She leads all of the foundation's grant-making programs. Current programs include clean energy, water, and sustainability education. The Mitchell Foundation can properly be termed as serving as an en engine of change by supporting high-impact projects at the triple bottom line of environment, equity, and economy. So we'll start off with hearing remarks from Mary Lou. Thank you, Jay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to, to be here today, and um, I'm channeling my colleague and friend, uh, Scott Anderson. He's on the program but he has the flu, and so I think we're all um, happy that he's not here, but uh, wishing, him, wishing him the best. And because I'm third string, the, um, the starting uh, keynote speaker for the team was uh, the director of the USGS, and she couldn't make it out of Washington today because of the storm, so we wish her the best too, and all of them. Um, I'd like to offer my congratulations uh, to Dean Mosher and Scott and the faculty at the Bureau and the Jackson School. And I was moved by the, the Jackson Five, as you call them, um, with the reminiscences, reminiscences of Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Jackson. I don't know if you're recording this or if that story is written down, but um, I know some of the same kind of stories about Mr. and Mrs. Mitchell that would give you all a chuckle. So I hope that that you've written that down or, or something um, as the record of the Jackson School. And it was clear to me from the looks that, that the Jackson Five were giving each other that, that you all clearly revered Mr. Jackson like I did Mr. Mitchell. Um, I worked for him. He hired me in 1996 to work on his initiatives on sustainability. And then they hired me away from themselves in 2008 to run the foundation's programming. So um, I, as uh, Marianne Rankin is quoted in the, the sheet about Mr. Jackson in the folder that she still misses him and I still, Mr., uh, I still miss Mr. Mitchell very much. The other thing I wanted to say sort of on the congratulatory note is that I know um, from my experience with Mr. Mitchell and the Mitchell family that when you give an endowment to a large organization, whether it's a university or something else, um, sometimes you don't really get what you really wanted out of the endowment. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but as I, um, as a grant maker 
to the University of Texas and then in listening to the speeches and whatnot today, it's very clear that the Jackson School delivers on Mr. and Mrs. Jackson's commitment, and that's a rare thing at a university. So Scott and everybody, I, um, I th I'm inspired by your success. I'd also like to recognize Jay. Um, Jay Banner, like Scott mentioned, he has a big program um, anniversary or milestone of his own tonight. My 10-year-old daughter is very excited to go to another hot science cool talk, um, this one on dinosaurs. So um, we're looking forward to that. I hope some of you all are able to, to make it. Um, I am a bit. I feel a little bit not as well prepared as I would ordinarily be as a keynote speaker, and um, I'm honored by that title, but really I'm just a speaker. So um, I'm going to present to you some ideas um, about the Mitchell Foundation and some general ideas about the role that the Jackson, Jackson School could play in moving the agenda forward on environmental decision making. Um, I'm not a geophysicist, a geologist, a geochemist, or anything else that starts with a G except generalist. Um, I couldn't do my job for the Mitchells if I was a geologist, and so I don't have anything specific to say about the field of geology or any of the other G words, but I do have some, I don't know, input or ideas that you all can take for what they are worth. I called this Science for Environmental environmental decision making, but I'm actually going to talk about three things. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the foundation because people ask me all the time about the foundation. I suspect some of you want to know what we do. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the funding landscape that you all find yourselves in now and probably um, in the future, although that's, that's hard to it's like predicting you know, energy prices or something like that. Not really possible, but I wanted to give you that context because I don't think that's been covered. And as the funder in the room, um, that might be interesting to you. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit about decision making. So um, Jay mentioned a little bit about this mission statement. I'm not going to read it to you. And I, I don't ordinarily like to put words on slides, but when you do it at the last minute, that's kind of the default, put words on slides. So anyway, um, we do have five programs, clean energy, water, shale sustainability, um, sustainability science and education. And we are now, right now, developing a land program that will start in the next couple of years. All of our programs are cross-cutting. Um, I could give 20 minutes just on these programs. Um, they're very complex and uh, cross-cutting programs. UT is the beneficiary of some of these, this funding, um, particularly of interest to you all probably in the water. Uh, we have a cross-cutting program between water and shale sustainability that Michael and Bridget work on. Um, the sustainability education grant comes to UT. They're the only beneficiary. They're the only uh, grantee under that program. Uh, we are, Mr. Mitchell was big on sustainability education, and so we have developed um, a new bachelor's degree in sustainability science here at UT, although it's in a holding pattern for various university reasons. Um, I want to talk about, I can talk about those programs forever, so I don't want to even hardly get started, but you all can ask me specific questions if you'd like about the goals of those programs um, and the initiatives that we have underneath them. Um, you'll see here some funding slides, and this is just to give you a thumbnail sketch. There's a lot to these numbers. They're AAAS numbers through 2015 with the um, budget proposal by the president. What I want to um, show here is that the trends in applied research by agency, if you look at NSF, you look at um, DOE, I think that's probably where you get most of your funding at, at the Jackson School. And it's not so much the shape of the curves, but the size of the little pieces of what would be pie if it was a circle chart. Um, 
the DOE money, it goes up and down a little bit. The NSF money is small, and it pre stays pretty flat. Um, Non-defense R&D by function, again, if you look at environment, it's sort of the lavender piece. And energy, it's the green piece. These are not large pieces of overall federal funding for um, research. Um, the next, this picture shows that overall this is um, higher education R&D. So this is your piece of the pie. Uh, these funds through 2014 are declining um, overall. And um, I don't know that we have any reason to believe that they will increase in the future. That's probably something that you all know more about than I do. But um, this is a significant, although the curve are not that sharp, this is a significant decrease in funding. This is NSF budget through 2014. You'll see what I want to point out here is that overall funding is increasing somewhat, sort of. But if you can see it, that red line down at the bottom, and even though you guys are geologists and related fields, social science funding at the, in term, from the foundation's point of view is essential and very much too, too small, too insignificant. That if we're going to move forward on the complex questions that we are addressing, whether we're social scientists or not, for the future, the future that um, Dr. Kunin talked about and, and others today, if we don't understand as humans what the human impact is and how uh, the consequences impact us, how we make decisions, what we value, what we teach our children, how we use resources, the trade-offs, the consequences. It's the thing we ourselves that we do not understand. And until we get a grip on what we, how we act and the decisions we make, we are not, in the foundation's opinion, my opinion, going to be able to move to a, a future that is sustainable. So we would like to see that red curve not only go up, but be much higher. Um, at the same time that federal funding is going down, corporate and philanthropic dollars are increasing. But you'll see the second smallest wedge is environment and animals, $10, $10 billion, which is not insignificant. But it's the second smallest wedge. It's 3% of overall philanthropy in this country. And then you'll see where it comes from. Foundations are 15%. Um, individuals, this is your $100 check to the Sierra Club or your $25 million endowment from Mr. and Mrs. Jackson or Mr. and Mrs. Mitchell. Um, the bulk of philanthropy in this country comes from individuals. One of the points I want to make on this slide is about the foundation funding for the environment. And this, this is a provocative statement, but only to other foundations, I think. The bulk of the environment funding over the past 10 years has transitioned from the environment to climate. Environment and climate have converged into one item. 90% of environmental funding is for climate change. Water, we used to talk about water, we used to talk about species, we used to talk about air quality, can you remember? I can barely remember those days. Today we talk about climate. And I work hard on my foundation colleagues to start thinking about the environment rather than just climate. So for now, I mean, I guess you all are fortunate that you're in um, earth sciences which is heavily related to climate change. But for our purposes, we would invite universities and NGOs and foundations to start thinking about the environment again. So you all might have seen this. Uh, it was just the other day. I think it was Monday. Um, 
this funny slide. Science versus everything else, that the simple, the answers are simple but wrong, that's where most people go, and the complex, but I would have written correct. <laughs> um, anyway, complex but correct, uh, simple but wrong. Um, the reason I wanted to put this on here is because, as you all know better than, than anyone, I'm sure, that the public use of science by decision makers is inadequate. That we either deny it or we don't understand it, we don't communicate it, um, they don't hear it. Um, all sorts of things are going on in this slide. So at dinner last night, we were talking, just by coincidence, um, about Posture's quadrant, who, which um, you guys are probably familiar with. In the mind of the foundation and the funding that we do on research, we want to be in the, the red circle. We fund a lot of research, and we'll continue to fund a lot of research, but it's user-inspired research because the problems that we need to solve, um, as important as pure applied research is and pure basic research is, for the purposes of the problems that we want to solve, we need more and better communicated information on the use-inspired basic research uh, quadrant. So this is, um, this is like the ideal normative, this is the theory of normative decision making. This is the ideal framework of how you make a decision. And of course, we all make these decisions all day long. Yogurt or cottage cheese or you know, Wheaties or Cheerios. We, we do this all day long for the very minor decisions to very, very important decisions. Harvard or Yale, I don't know where to send my kid, um, to where to put my parents in retirement living. Some questions are very, very complex. Some are very, base, very simple, but they all pretty much follow this pattern. But we're not ideal uh, people, we're not linear, as linear as this would make it seem. But what I want you to take away um, from this slide is that I uh, starred and uh, put in bold font the areas where research, user-inspired research, influences decision making. And this is not mine. This is, well, this particular slide is from an NAA, a National Academy of Sciences publication. But this is normative decision-making theory. And I would, I would challenge Scott and, and the team at the Jackson School and the Bureau to say, where does our research feed in? If I'd had more time, I would have di done a diagram or something and, and looked at y'all's portfolio and said, these are the areas that you're currently investigating or formerly investigating that are feeding into these decision-making um, milestones and then made some suggestions on where you could build on those. But I have just this um, right now to provide you. But clearly defines the decision to be made. That, that is such a fundamental first step. But how often do we think, as we sit down to do some research or propose some research or to sit in the lab or do an experiment, how often do we think, OK, I want to do this piece of research because I, I need to define this decision. Decision makers need some data. They need a model. They need to understand the way the, something in the science or the research or the world or the Earth systems, they need to understand better what is going on. Identify and create attractive alternatives to management of a resource or management of a problem. Science does that all the time. But are we getting those results to the decision makers that need them? 
really all of these, that's a good question for any of these, consider the consequences of the alternatives with the available evidence. And well, when you deny the evidence, it makes it very difficult to consider the consequences. Look at climate change. Whether you believe in it or not, it's really hard to get to management practices or to figure out what to do with it if you're not um, buying into the available evidence. Uncertainty. All of this work is awash in uncertainty. The data, the data's never right. The models based on the data, they're not precise enough. How do you deal with uncertainty when you're making really expensive and really difficult choices and trade-offs between alternative management scenarios about really important resources? And then, of course, you have to consider the implications of your decisions. And this goes into adaptive management. As your models get better, the models that we're using now to make important decisions are going to be much better in five years and, and at the next 10 year anniversary of the Jackson School. But will they have, will they be, a, will our policies and decisions be adaptable enough that we can change on the fly how we're doing things? It's, it's uh, simple adaptive management, although it's not simple to do. Oops. So, um, at the, I guess what I would offer, I guess you all are writing a strategic plan, so what I would offer, and there's a, a lot more to this um, that I could say, but as I look at the Jackson School and at the needs that I hear decision makers, decision makers come to me and say, we need more information on X, Y, Z because we can't figure out whether we should comply with the clean power plan or not. And that basic, that comes down to basic scientific questions, whether it's economic science, um, energy modeling, we fund a lot of that. The renewables, the trade-offs between renewables, coal and gas on, let's say, water resources, land resources, take your pick. Decision makers need to know all of this and it's all it all has to come from the research community. I would say two big areas where we need to improve that I think the Jackson School, as an organization that already does some of these, what I would call boundary organization activities, um, two areas where you could grow and that we need to see growth is to create opportunities. You need to create opportunities where your research and the results of your modeling, et cetera, are communicated to decision makers. And not just communicated to them, you need to bring them in as you're designing your studies. It has to be user inspired. If there was a policymaker in this room, and I don't, I don't know, I don't think that there is, it would be interesting to ask that person okay, you need to figure out what you want to do on groundwater surface water conjunctive use. One of the most important questions facing this state right now that we never talk about. It's one of the foundation's water grand challenges. Surface water and groundwater are the same resource in this state or in parts of the state. We don't know how to manage them. The state owns the surface rights. No one owns the groundwater rights. It's all the same water, it goes up and down. Well, Bridget knows that. There's a handful of people in this room that know that. There's not a policymaker that knows that. And yet they're making important, critical decisions about water management for this state that far surpass the impacts of climate change on the state, I argue. They need to know what the science is, it needs to be a communicated in a way that is appropriate for them, and they need to be brought in from the beginning to help define the problem and the study. Um, we think in the future, as these problems become more complex, the decisions become more complex, 
the feedback loops, the whole complexity of it all, engaging with more stakeholders, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, policymakers, corporate leaders, is going to be even more and more important. And I know that, I know at the Bureau, they already do that. I suspect at the Jackson School, you all do that as well, and you're certainly well positioned to do that. Um, we need to build capacity in order for organizations like the Jackson School to build those linkages with policymakers and, uh, and corporate decision makers as well, to create training problems that link knowledge to action. You all have the knowledge. Um, as your funding gets more difficult and you want to be, be, be relevant and stay relevant, to turn that knowledge into policy action or best practices at a corporation on something that they're trying to solve, the, the power of that is, I, I don't know, it's, um, it's staggering to me as I try to navigate that process as a funder. And then to engage students and other researchers in sort of small activities, not small, but specific activities to learn by doing a sustainability clinic modeled after the law clinics where they're solving real world problems by designing a research program or a research project with a practitioner, with a policymaker, brings a problem to them and then they work on it together in an inter interdisciplinary way and then make, communicate the results back to that policymaker would be, I think, very important to consider. Thank you very much. We can leave that up there. Those are good thoughts. Thanks very much, Mary Lou. I think it's really refreshing to have someone outside the school, someone outside the geosciences to provide this perspective. Um, I think Mary Lou's comments and three previous panels sort of all underscored that the environment is squarely part of the geosciences. So I think it's this panel's job to really, really dig into that. So let me start by asking, making the statement that there is a number of pressing environmental problems our society <coughs> faces today. Climate, water, sea level rise, how are we going to create enough food to feed eight to nine billion people? I want to ask in your view, which is the most pressing and why? That's sort of a preliminary question. And then I also want to follow up with, where can the geosciences make the biggest contribution towards understanding the nature of the challenge and potential solutions? And so let me start off with Dan. All right, so the answer to your question, Jay, is time scale dependent. And while I think that sea level rise is not going to be so much of a problem over the next couple of decades, uh, the further you look into the future, the more of a problem it becomes. And the reason that I say that is that when we look in the rock record, um, the rock record indicates that uh, at, uh, at, at or near current atmospheric CO2 levels, ice sheets are not stable on Greenland or Antarctica. So if you look back over the past 65 million years, if, if atmospheric CO2 was above 400 parts per million, there was no ice. parts of the world and, and sea level was about 14 meters higher. So the oceanographic and glaciological communities are, 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 are working on predicting how quickly those ice sheets are going to melt. But to the best of our knowledge and to our geological knowledge, sea level will eventually increase by 14 meters, which is going to displace a large portion of the world's population. Thanks, Dan. Um, same question for you, Jenny that it depends on the scale. Um, for me, locally, I worry actually more about water resources in Austin, Texas, because there's people moving here every day. It's a very popular place to be. And we have a finite uh, water resource that is not very well filtered as it travels through our uh, karst aquifer. And so I worry about that on a very local scale. Of course, I also, as a glaciologist, worry about uh, sea level rise on a long time scale. but. It, it does depend on the scales that we're looking at, both time and space, what I would argue. Cool, thanks. Adam. 
this may come as a surprise, but I'm going to pick climate. And um, I think the climate is actually uh, not scale dependent. You have uh, climate change that can happen on the scale of, of decades or years. For instance, uh, many of you were here in 2010, 2011, and you see what uh, lack of precipitation could do for water availability for Austin. So uh, even though we have, you know, some cities in Texas have groundwater resources that they can tap, the, the lack of water availability from the sky really stresses population. As the population grows, that will get worse. And then you also have the, the long-term uh, climate change is a worry as well, which goes, feeds the sea level rise. Uh, that water availability also feeds. Changes in precipitation patterns uh, change how we're going to feed people and grow enough food. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Um, so, Michael, um, the UN has identified access to safe drinking water as a millennial goal for the 21st century. Even in the US, especially in Texas, we expect water resource shortages, quality, quantity of water challenges that are gonna affect a big segment of our society. Where can we, the Jackson School, most effectively participate in reducing, even take it to the level of conflicts over water? Perhaps a stepping off point might be Mary Lou's comments on uh, conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater and how challenged our state is to recognize that holistically. Right, no, that's a good question. Um, so, but I, I want to, uh, before I answer that, I want to also add my two cents on this, uh, sort of these grand challenges. Um, because I think that, you know, and as Dan said, this is a, this is a scaling issue. Um, you know, the, an article, uh, I think in the New York Times a month ago, indicated that, the, that part of the Syrian conflict was due to a multi-year drought that forced uh, people back into the urban centers, which then led to a conflict, which now we have migration of over multiple millions of people that are now moving through Europe. So when you're talking about uh, large-scale impacts to society, it's, uh, it's, it's the linkages between food, between climate, between water that we have to worry about. It's the things that we know the least about, it's these connections uh, between these complex systems that we really need to focus on. because. Uh, in the long run, if we're really focusing on 100 years, we're going to miss the fact that there's uh, millions of refugees now that have nowhere to go. Um, and uh, so, but getting back to your question about, about water, you know, while, while I was sitting there multitasking at my, uh, at my table, of course, during, only during the break, um, I was sort of looking at the water supplies of two parts of the U U.S. One is in the, in the Colorado River Basin uh, from Lake Mead uh, down, and the other is in the Atlanta. Georgia area, and a couple of years ago, in, in 1999, um, Atlanta was two weeks away from water. This is a humid area with 50 inches of precip a year. They were two weeks away from water, and uh, the governor at the time indicated that uh, they were going to call the National Guard, the State National Guard, to force the Corps of Engineers to shut down uh, Lake Lanier. And, uh, and meanwhile, in the West right now, Lake Mead is at 1082, uh, elevation of 1082, and when the Lake Mead drops another seven feet, uh, Arizona will lose more than 200,000 acre feet of water per year. So, and that's a and that's a very arid area. So we're really looking at water issues uh, that are are, are local, uh, local shortages and, and regional problems that uh, we're going to have to deal with. Um, where the Jackson School um, can kind of fit in, and this a couple of years ago, um, uh, Dean Mosier invited a number of people from the Jackson School up to Jet Propulsion Lab to talk with NASA about the kinds of work that we do in the Jackson School in terms of basic data collection on the ground. NASA's really great at shooting off rockets and, and building satellites, but they're not very good at taking on the ground measurements by their own admittance. So what, where we can really fit in is, is collecting the basic data and adding value to that data through interpretation and then communicating that to a variety of different stakeholders as Mary Lou mentioned. I think Dan gave a really great example of how there's a unique ability of the geosciences to look to the past to help us understand problems for the future in the case of uh, sea level rise. So if you guys want to weigh in on other examples, because I think this is one of the most valuable things geosciences brings to understanding the environment, is the ability to look on longer time scales, go back past the effect of anthropogenic influence on our systems to see what the baseline, what natural changes there are, mat rates, magnitudes, timing. Um, any other examples where you think the geosciences is pretty well suited to make a big contribution? Well, I think uh, one of the areas and, and also one of the strengths of the Jackson School is in uh, 
paleontology. Because ultimately, you know, what we want to know about environmental changes is how they affect ecosystems. And if we can look to the past to understand how environmental changes have affect, affected ecosystems, then maybe we can better understand you know, our current situation. In other words, there's so much in those outcrops every time you go back to them. Eventually, you would like to see going back to an outcrop and reconstructing both climate environmental change as well as ecosystem change in the same time scales. Right, and understanding how those climate and environmental changes affect ecosystems so we can better predict. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's, let's look forward uh, a decade or a generation. Let's say, let's look forward to 2030, 2050. What do you think will be the key research questions in this arena of the environment? What new methods are there going to be to answer these questions? So I'll give you an example. What will the Greenland ice sheet look like in 2050? How will we be studying it differently than we are today? We saw some examples this morning of how ice sheets are being studied. Um, what will be, what, what do you guys foresee as some of the big, big advances if we look a generation down the road? And it's open to whoever would like to take it. Well, I know a little bit about Greenland, uh, so I can talk about that. Um, so I, I, I would argue that we don't have observational record currently to really say a lot about natural versus forest variability in Greenland. And so we really need to focus on more satellite-based observations so we can get the time series built up so that we can kind of answer those questions about, you know, how is Greenland being forced from, uh, from humans versus separate from any kind of regular climate variability. And we're, we're already getting close to that point. We have uh, 30 to 40 year records that are building up from a lot of satellite images that were launched in the um, 70s. There's some older data from the 1960s. But we're still not at the point where we can try to answer some of these fundamental questions about why one glacier behaves one way and a glacier right next to it behaves in a different way. We think it has a lot to do with the geometry of the system, which is kind of a really simple answer. Um, but we need more information and more observations to really say with certainty. So I would say that satellite records are going to help us to answer that question in the future. And the other thing is computational resources. We are, uh, I like to say we're, in terms of ice sheet modeling, we're at the toddler phase of life. Um, we're, we are past infancy and we're trying to, we're answer, able to answer a few questions, but we're not really able to solve big problems. And a, a big part of that is because of the interface between ice sheets and the forcing factors. The atmosphere and the, and the ice sheet interface is pretty well constrained, I might argue. You could maybe argue with me about that. Um, but ice and ocean interactions is really poorly constrained, and we don't really have the physics right at that boundary. So it's a computational challenge to try to model across that boundary, but it's also an, a huge observational challenge because most of the ice is underneath the ocean. Um, so that's, I would say, the next forefront for the, the next few decades, at least, for, for glaciology. Thanks. Jenny, anyone else? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try something. I'm going to look right at that young man over there so that I don't... Uh, <laughs> so that he stays calm. Um, and we can pass the bottle of tequila right over there. I think we probably have not used all of it yet. I, I think the great advances are going to be made in the simple things that we haven't thought of. I think it's, it's in the noise. It's in the noise of the data we're collecting now that we can turn into signal. It's the data we're collecting, but we're not collating. Right? There's thousands and thousands of weather stations that are on households. They're on golf courses. They're all over that are being used for temperature, for precip, that we're not incorporating into regional models and regional understanding of what we're doing. Um, there we, can, we can measure atmospheric obscurance by using full waveform LIDAR, which we've been throwing away for years because it's just too uh, difficult to collect and to store. And so there's all this noise that we're basically throwing away. Sergey mentioned earlier today that he's reanalyzing uh, and removing signal and boosting signal to noise uh, ratio by just looking at the noise portion of that. And I think there's a lot of value in that, in that part of the science that we've been throwing away because we have a preconceived bias of what's signal. And I think the challenge is going to be for us to rethink what those biases are and start looking at those noise signals and trying to back out some, some signal. Uh, as far as topics for the climate system, I think CO2 is going to remain uh, one of the largest uh, subjects of the future, into the future, even looking back on our, on our, on our projections that we've made uh, now, 
and seeing you know, where we went wrong, where we went right. Um, also the future of sea ice and snowpack, but I think uh, permafrost regions and their changes uh, are gonna be something that's gonna be a, a very interest, uh, a lot of interest to us in the future, uh, seeing that we get uh, methane production from permafrost regions. If those melt, that will increase CO2, CO2 as well. So um, that in ocean acidification topics. Thanks. You know, I have to say, one thing I'm impressed by after uh, teaching at UT for 25 years, and uh, every fall I teach a class with 250 students in a big lecture hall, so even bigger scale than this. And one thing that's sort of easy to detect, I guess it's taken me a while, but after 25 years, it's kind of easy to detect uh, out of 250 people, who are the three who are not paying attention, who are not engaged? And uh, students are always surprised because they think they're sort of one of many and they're kind of hidden. And uh, applying it here, I'm really impressed how everyone's really engaged and into this. And uh, that leads me to my, to my next question, unless you see me move off the podium, because what I do in the lecture hall is I start walking towards where those students are. So <laughs> as long as I'm up here, everything, that means everything's going, going well and you're fully engaged. So that brings me to a question uh, for the panel about um, education. Um, the general question, and I'll follow it with more specific ones, is sort of what new areas of geoscience and environmental education is the Jackson School well suited to enter into? Let me get it a little more specific. That environmental challenges are inherently very interdisciplinary. Will our educational efforts, do you think, need to move in this direction? And a second more specific question is, how can we do this in a way that we prepare an outstanding geoscience and environmental science workforce? Because these are inherently very synergistic and vital challenges for our society. And producing the future leaders and professionals who are going to help address these problems is as important as anything we could do on the research side. So where do you see the Jack School going in this regard? And whoever would like to try it first. Someone about to enter the workforce. Um, I would say that it, that it is interdisciplinary, and, and that's one thing that you, that is going to have to strengthen. Uh, it's the strength already of the Jackson School, but it will have to strengthen further. Uh, pretty much every student now, as you're coming out of, out of the university into the, into the workforce, there, there are only so many tenure track positions out there. Um, you have to have com computation skills. You have to have analytical skills. And uh, it really should probably in the future be included into the curriculum as far as uh, uh, having the statistical knowledge to be able to mine big data and uh, being able to handle these large data sets and knowing how much you can feed into, uh, into at a time. Um, as well as, uh, for instance, most of the jobs that I look at on, uh, for the government are, are all inter interdisciplinary jobs. It's either a physical scientist is the way they describe it now, and you're either, you're, it's a climate scientist and oceanographer, or geologist and oceanographer, or uh, geochemist. So we need, again, to, to strengthen our, our, our interdisciplinary curriculum. Thanks. Anyone else along those lines? I, I guess I'd say that, um, we're thinking about, well, are we, are, we, are we worried about the environment or are we worried about climate? And I really think that they're intimately tied together. You know, humans have been affecting their environment for a long time. Lions cut down all the rainforest in Central America, a large portion of it. So now we're in this stage where we're, uh, we're affecting the, the global environment. You want to know what the ramifications of that are. How serious is this problem going to be? And so even the idea that the hum humans could affect the global environment is a, is a very new concept to humanity. And future gen generations are going to have to deal with that. It's going to have to be interdisciplinary. And it's really, you know, I, I, we're here to promote the Jackson School. But really, those questions are going to be, have to be solved by collaborations with the Jackson School, among other institutions. In, in, economics and in policy and, and across the board. So maybe the Jackson School can at least have a role in, um, in uh, you know, the, the, sort of the, the, the fields of um, climate and uh, energy and um, giving the students that we educate a background in both of those so that they can go on and, and help the world make good decisions. Let me follow up with that uh, quite cogent argument of Jack School having a role Put a finer point on it. Do you think the Jack School should be a leader in that regard? Oh, uh, well, I, I think we should, and I think we can be. Um, 
And I think that we can probably do a better job than we have been doing by uh, opening up the avenues of, of communication among the different units that sort of do these different things. Thanks, Jim. And to some extent, the EER program within the Jackson School is already designed to be that kind of interdisciplinary program. And, and, uh, and you know, and the, and the difficulty and the balance is that, is that the faculty need to be narrow and deep. And students need to be focused on some skill sets that they can use when they get done. But at the same time, they have to be broad enough and have a broad enough perspective. And that's a real challenge long term for how to, to grow the program. Um, you know, when you're talking about environmental education, ultimately it comes down to uh, outreach. And uh, Jay, you know, your um, uh, Hot Science Cool Talks is a, is a prime example of that. You know, the, you know it's, and it, again, it's the real simple things. It's just, you know, from a water standpoint, I mean, I'll, I'll poll the audience here um, shamelessly and ask how many people know how much water is being used in your own household per month, just a show of hands. So about half, maybe a third know how much. So, and, it's the, and here we are in Austin, right, where we, we go through these punctuated major droughts and we have maybe a third know how much water is being used in the house. So it's the, it's the easy things that we can use. To, if we have the information, we can make decisions. And somehow we're not getting that information to the public from the geoscience standpoint. So that's a nice uh, bridge from talking about education. I like to sort of aim towards closing here with talking about outreach. So beyond the university. And so I think there's a number of things as to sort of presage what the, what the question will be. There's Mary Lou's uh, comments about how important it is to engage decision makers and uh, be able to speak each other's language. And not, uh, not just at the, after you've completed your study, but at, from, the, from the ground up. I think we heard from uh, George Davis this morning saying, without outreach, we're toast. And that, that encapsulates it well. But I think we consider the other side of the motivations. Society in general, and Texas in particular, is facing some really major challenges in this regard. Right? We're part of a public serving institution. We're a flagship R1 university. So in that regard, we, and as, to sum all of that up, as Jack said in his letter, for the citizens of Texas. So asking this question about outreach, and uh, just got a question that encapsulates all this as well. So let me read it. It's, uh, it's all in red and in caps, so I think this is a really important question, very emphatic. <laughs> Why doesn't the BEG Jackson School educate the public better regarding how many catastrophic sea level changes have occurred since the Cambrian era? So this all brings together uh, outreach. What is, how can we gain, what are the new areas of geoscience and environmental public outreach, again, that the school is well suited to go into? Can we engage decision makers through such outreach? Are our outreach innovations an important part of how we're gonna solve these environmental challenges we face? Who would like to? Take that on. Um, well, we, we live in the U.S., and our, our government is is um, inherently uh, fractured. What I mean by that is is it's largely controlled locally, and a lot of our outreach now um, seems to be not necessarily with local policymakers. As not, I don't mean the Jackson School in general. I just mean scientists in particular. Um, a lot of it is done through the UN in climate, the IPCC. So you're, you're talking to a global institution at this point who then comes down to national policymakers. But really, the way to get things done as far as locally, if you're talking about water issues, is to talk to state policymakers, to talk to actual voters themselves. A lot of policymakers, as, as one of my colleagues, Jenny, made, er, she made earlier in the, in the week, a lot of policymakers won't, make, uh, won't vote for certain decisions because of their voters and, and not necessarily because of their own will. So getting down to the voters and being able to talk to them, being able to talk to the, to the local policymakers and the state policymakers, I think is where, where the big changes can, can actually start to go from the ground up instead of trying to go from the top down. And, and I would say I'm, I'm, I'm actually um, encouraged by the elected officials in Texas and the, and the reliance that they place on us to give them data they need to make decisions. We have a lot of representatives that come to the Bureau. We are asked to talk with staffers. We're asked to go to uh, have hearings, particularly in years between when the, when the ledge is in session. And you know, and I've lived in Georgia, Nevada, Arizona, and they, was, they just could not care less about what the universities do. I mean, it's a very, very different here. And, I, I, and, and to me, I'm actually encouraged by it. Now, when you get to the federal level, you know, God help us. Um, 
but really down here in, in Texas, I, I think we're doing a reasonably good job. And you're talking about receiving the outreach from the university, as, and that's variable at these different levels. How about the university's inherent, uh, you know, this is a part of the fabric of the university. We do research awesomely. We do education at the university level equally well, uh, but not sort of, it's not really institutionalized. The things that are, you're describing the Bureau's efforts are, are things that are um, innovative and creative on their part, not part of, uh, not as part of the mission as research and education is. Should it be? And how can we, what kind of innovative things are on the horizon in that regard? Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's how, you know, and we're, we have this project right now that, uh, that was mentioned earlier called TexNet, and we're really trying to monitor earthquakes across the state. And one of the aspects of that program is on just on the communications and on the psychology of how the public, the non-scientific public, interprets data and uses that to influence their biases. And I think that we need to understand, we need to be more empathetic with the public and to understand how they can accept, how data gets in through the stone wall, you know, that they're, everybody's facing all the time. Because so many people, there's so much static out there, the challenge is getting past the static and having the data that we're doing resonating with them. And I, 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 don't, I don't think there's a, comes to a point in time where it's say, yeah, we, we do it well enough now and we can stop trying to improve. Right, I mean, I think it's something that is a constant educational process, and um, you know, and this is the thing about UT, it's huge, and there's a lot of assets that we can use for this. So we have people in the psychology department, the communications, that are working with us specifically on this topic. And I think we can make better use of that with kind of interdisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anyone else have thoughts along these lines? All right, well, I think that's a great note to end on. I think it's time for the next set of closing remarks. Thanks everyone for your attention.